The Earth's magnetosphere was one of the first discoveries of the space age. We knew that the Earth had a magnetic field and we knew it varied a great deal and we knew the Sun controlled the variations in the magnetic field. But really, until the space age, we didn't know for sure that the Earth lives inside a magnetic cavity called the magnetosphere. Um, so the first discoveries of the magnetosphere were made with the first spacecraft in 1959 and 1960. It's a long time ago. And what did we discover? Well, we discovered that the Earth's magnetic field extends out in space and makes a cavity around the Earth. But then, puzzlingly enough, it's full of rather unpleasant high-energy radiation. In fact, an early, ex early space scientist said, space is radioactive. <laughs> and so the magnetosphere both protects us, but also has this property of containing uh, high energy radiation that's potentially um, dangerous. And so we have to understand quite where that radiation comes from and, uh, if you like, how we avoid it having a negative impact, first of all, on astronauts, but also on spacecraft. And you think, well, spacecraft, they're surely resilient. They're out in a vacuum. They must be OK. But no, spacecraft uh, work because of electronics and high energy particles can really damage electronics. Indeed, I would say that probably in the 1970s, we had a series of losses of spacecraft, one of which could have started World War III because it wasn't known by the Americans that it was natural damage that had occurred because of the spacecraft being hit by uh, high energy radiation and not, uh, let's say, enemy action from perhaps the Soviet Union or some other enemy at the time. Uh, happily now, we do understand things and we spend a fair amount of time trying to predict what's going on for exactly that reason. The science is really, for me, very exciting. When I was a student, I had to choose. I wanted to study plasma physics and magnetohydrodynamics. And I had two choices. One was to go into the laboratory and work on nuclear fusion, because that was the hope of a future electricity supply. It still is. We have big amounts of international activity trying to make a fusion reactor that will be a very clean source of energy. But then the other alternative was to do plasmas in space. For me, I thought space was more exciting. And so um, the Earth's magnetosphere is space very close to home, but it gives you the chance with, us, with spacecraft to look in detail at processes that could be far off in the cosmos. You can, we have, if you like, astrophysics close to home. And for me, that's always been my first love about the magnetosphere of Earth, has been the physics going on in this fourth state of matter. We know about solids, liquids, gases. There's a fourth state called plasma, which is very hard to sustain on Earth because it has to have a high temperature. But actually, much of the universe is in the plasma state. So it's actually normal if you were a truly cosmic being, but it's abnormal if you happen to live on the Earth, as we do. So uh, the Earth's magnetosphere is the easiest place to get to. 
where it's occurring naturally and where you can see processes going on. There's a subtle coupling between the sun and the earth through the plasma processes that connect the sun's magnetic field with the earth's magnetosphere. For me, I worked in a research group at Imperial College which first really opened up the understanding of this, the open magnetosphere that explained how the Earth's magnetosphere coupled with the Sun. For me though, the real excitement is again in what the magnetosphere produces just naturally. I myself spent much of my early career working on the complicated waves, they're called magnetohydrodynamic waves, inside the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere is a closed volume and so it's like an echo chamber. There are these complicated waves that get excited when the sun buffets the magnetosphere of Earth. So that made me very happy for really the first half of my career I was working in that area. Now probably the thing that still remains something of a puzzle is the structure in the aurora, in the northern lights, and the southern lights for that matter. Um, for me, we understand at a basic level how they occur, but when you go and watch them, I, I've spent a lot of time in Norway and Sweden seeing the aurora and when I watch it I just think it's so much more complicated than, um, than the simple theory suggests. The simple theories are explaining why you need to go to northern Norway to see it or to Iceland or to the north to Novosemlia in Russia or wherever. You've got to go to the very north to see the aurora but um, you have uh, the structure, the wave, it's like curtains in the sky, you see it moving and you see multiple curtains. For me, I've never felt we've really cracked the whole problem. It certainly links back to plasma physics occurring far out in the Earth's magnetosphere. So I still see the magnetosphere as something we need to go on studying. I still think um, this is a valid way to spend public money. We should be exploring this. Uh, some people say it's just because of the impact, because we need, in a connected society where we all use electronic equipment, we use phones, televisions, communication systems, etc., all of which can be disrupted by magnetospheric weather. That for me is only part of the story if we still can't explain the whole system. I still see real basic science to do out there. And that basic science, by and large, I feel has impact beyond the Earth. It has it. My work on magnetohydrodynamic waves had an impact on how we saw waves in the solar atmosphere. Frankly, we're doing astrophysics close to home. We can put spacecraft into actually inside things we couldn't dream of anywhere else in the universe. We should go on ensuring we explore this system around us, the Earth's magnetosphere.